This is an extract from a video tutorial, the whole of which is available at www.physics.org. There are musical instruments of all shapes and sizes that we blow into, which rely on standing waves in tubes. Sometimes the tubes are open at one end and closed at the other, and sometimes they're open at both ends. Most of these instruments are complicated shapes and difficult to analyse. It's difficult to see the connection between the note and the size of the instrument. So we will look not at simple musical instruments, but at a very simple arrangement of a tube in a jar. The tube's put in the jar because by raising and lowering the tube in the jar, we can alter and easily measure its length. We can use this arrangement together with a source of sound which produces a standard note, in this case a tuning fork. We will raise and lower the tube until there is resonance between the tuning fork and the note produced by the tube. The resonant frequency is the frequency at which the two notes exactly match, and at that point we get a loud note. Now changing forks and using one with a longer wavelength. The resonant point is at a different length, which we can measure, although perhaps not very accurately. The design frequency of the forks is stamped on the stem, but we can check that with a frequency meter. When the fork is placed near the mouth of the tube, it agitates the molecules in the tube like this. Those near the fork move backwards and forwards a lot, whereas those at the closed end of the tube move relatively little. By selecting just a few of the molecules, you can see how the relative movement changes as we move down the tube from the mouth where the movement is large to the closed end where the movement is zero. If we measure the increasing amplitude as we move down the tube and then turn that into a graph along the tube, the line shown in green would look something like this. Remind yourself that sound is a longitudinal wave. The motion of the molecules is up and down the tube. The green line is a representation of the amplitude of the movement, but it is not across the tube, as the line seems to suggest at first glance. We can use this measurement of the length of the tube to calculate the speed of sound. This graph line helps us see that we have here a small portion of the wave. If we reduce the size of the diagram and then extend the graph line so that we can see a complete wave, then from this extended diagram we can see that the original part of the tube is equal to a quarter wavelength. If we measure this and use that in conjunction with the frequency of the fork which we've also measured, then we can use that to calculate the speed of sound in air. Looking closely at the resonance points again, the length of the tube at resonance is around 155 millimetres. Remember that the 155 millimetres represents a quarter of a wave. A whole wave, therefore, quite obviously, is four times that length. That is 0.62 metres. For any wave, its velocity is equal to its frequency multiplied by its wavelength. The frequency of this fork was 524 Hz. The wavelength, 0.62 meters, gives us a speed of sound in air of 325 meters per second. Although, as we'll discuss shortly, the error on this measurement is likely to be quite large. This extract represents about a third of the total tutorial. There is a further tutorial on standing waves in wires. With many others, these are available at www.physics.org. Thanks for watching.